And one of the things he said in class was that if you want to be a writer, you should study human nature in a bar. And uh, that thought was in my mind when I took that job, and it turned out to be uh, very bad advice. I'm Paul Hastings, and you're listening to Compelled, a weekly podcast with unique stories from the kingdom of God told by the people compelled to live for him. In the last two episodes, we've heard the story of Kathy Brace, who spent much of her life chasing after love and acceptance, but only found bitterness and rejection. She became pregnant at age 15 and ended up adopting out two of her children and aborted another amid many other trials in her life. But then we heard how God saved her, redeemed her broken life, and miraculously reunited her with both of her children that she had adopted out. Today, Kathy is a midwife who uses the terrible experiences she had as a younger woman to help other women as they deliver their babies. Just an incredible story of redemption. You can hear all of that by listening to our last two episodes on compelledpodcast.com or wherever else you listen to podcasts. Our guest today, though, is John Erickson, the author of the popular children's book series, Hank the Cowdog, which has sold over 10 million copies. John has a lighthearted approach in the way that he writes, and much of it has to do with the Christian worldview that he carries. But before he became an acclaimed author, John would have to understand that God had a plan for him that was very different than his own. That story coming up right after a word from today's sponsor. Forge Ministries is a Christian nonprofit organization who believes that the education of our children is synonymous with biblical discipleship. Forge seeks to build, equip, and encourage families by hosting biblically themed events throughout the year. Their annual fall conference is coming up this September 5th through 7th, and the theme is Taming the Tongue. Speakers such as Kevin Swanson, Scott Brown, and many other pastors will be digging deep into God's Word to see what it says about the tongue. The conference is in the beautiful town of Kerrville, tucked away in the Texas Hill Country, and is a perfect getaway for you and your family this fall. And fun note, I actually attended the first Forge conference several years ago, and I was blessed not only by the sessions, but by the people that were attending. It was deeply encouraging to be surrounded by like-minded believers, and I have no doubt that this year will be the same as well. For more information about this year's conference, visit forgeministries.org, and there you can view past events, sign up for their newsletter, and look at a list of who their current speakers are. And as a Compelled Podcast listener, you can receive 10% off of your conference registration using the promo code COMPELLED. Again, that's 10% off using the promo code COMPELLED. You can find all of that by visiting forgeministries.org. Before we jump into today's story, let me just clarify that this is definitely a change of pace from our last two episodes. We had some pretty heavy material in those last two, so we wanted to make sure that we followed up with something a bit more lighthearted. And lighthearted is a great way to describe John Erickson. I've known John for about five years, and he always has a twinkle in his eye and a sharp wit, which in retrospect makes him the perfect author for the Hank the Cowdog series. I read a lot of Hank the Cowdog books growing up as a kid. They aren't explicitly Christian, but they carry a Christian worldview, which in today's world of children's literature is increasingly rare. And a Christian worldview was an integral part of John Erickson's life growing up, which also played a role in his journey to becoming an author. I was raised in the small farm and ranch community of Perryton, Texas, which is the farthest north county seat in Texas, up Uh, about halfway between Amarillo and Dodge City, Kansas, and uh, a very unlikely place for an author to get his start. And I grew up on my mother's stories, and they had a uh, much more profound effect on me than I ever would have dreamed. When I was five years old, my mother told me that God had given me a gift, and she didn't know what it was. But she thought that I had a gift, and she said, you better take good care of it, honor it. My mother came out of an oral tradition of storytelling, which is uh, the ranching tradition is is a strong oral tradition even to this day, uh, in spite of cellular phones and uh, computers. Country people still tell stories when you find them at uh, a wedding or a funeral or a a prairie fire, 4th of July picnic, 
they tell stories and that's a tradition that I I came out of and nobody in my family did much writing they were uh, they spoke impeccably grammatical English and were fanatical about it we were not allowed to uh, misuse the English language in my home we were always corrected uh, my people wrote good letters they could quote and often did quote the King James Bible hmm. but they they didn't write or even think much about writing beyond writing letters so there was no literary tradition in my family but there was a reverence for the written word much like the people he grew up around, John enjoyed listening to and telling stories, but he didn't have much interest in writing until his senior year in high school when he was assigned to write a poem for his English class. John made a surprising discovery. Writing came to him easily and he enjoyed it. Eventually, writing became John's passion and he decided to pursue it as a career. More specifically, John wanted to become a novelist and write serious books on important topics. He wanted to become the next Charles Dickens, Mark Twain, or Ernest Hemingway. So John set off with grand plans to realize his dream. I spent a lot of years learning or trying to learn what it means to be a novelist. I didn't know anyone who, who wrote novels when I was in college. And uh, so I had to figure out what novelists are supposed to do. And I read um, a lot of Texas writers and uh, went on a binge to read the French and the Russians and and British novelists. Went to the University of Texas and got a little bit of book learning that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And uh, went two years to Harvard Divinity School and uh, there made the startling discovery that I would not end up in New York or Boston because I just did not belong there, and uh, it took me a long time to accept that. I had supposed that success for a small-town Texas kid was to leave and never to go back, and uh, in many cases with other writers, that's the way it's been, but it was not that way with me, and uh, Chris and I moved back to Texas, and in 1970, we visited my parents uh, with the intention of staying a few days, and uh, we ended up not leaving. By this point, John had been married to his wife, Christine, for a few years, and John's plans to become a great author had definitely not gone the way he had expected. Even though he had a Harvard education, what he had learned in school didn't seem to have any actual real-life application. His dream of becoming an acclaimed novelist wasn't working out. And in the meantime, he needed an income and ended up taking a job he thought would help him grow as an author, based on some advice he received from a class at Harvard. It was a year-long course on fiction writing, and uh, most of us were writing short stories and uh, thinking about writing novels. But there was one, one young man in the class who had finished a novel, and uh, he was sort of the star of the class. And one of the things he said in class was that if you want to be a writer, you should s study human nature in a bar. And uh, that thought was in my mind when I took that job, and it turned out to be uh, very bad advice yeah. as far as I was concerned, because the human nature you see in a... Uh, saloon is the kind of stories that uh, don't make good good stories as far as I'm concerned. You see people at their worst, or close to their worst, certainly not their best. They tend to be demanding, selfish, loud, rude, and uh, I made notes for three years of things I saw in the bar and I never used any of them. I despised every moment I was there, but I was writing. Most of what I wrote in those years uh, has gone to the trash, but I was able to do the work for my the first book I had published, which is uh, called Through Time in the Valley. It's a 
It's a historical book about the Canadian River Valley in the Texas Panhandle. Nothing much had been written about that part of the country. It was a big, it's a big, wild, empty country that was full of adventure stories, and I spent um, a little more than a year gathering those stories and uh, then strung them together on a 140-mile horseback ride down the river. Wow. And uh, that's one thing I did accomplish while I was working as a flunky bartender. If you want to find good stories, go to places where people are working. People are usually at best when they're working at the craft that uh, means the most to them. That might be uh, something as simple as preparing meals in a kitchen or raising children or working on a pipeline as a welder or as in my case uh, cowboying. That was a great source of story material for me. After three years as a bartender, John had had enough. In 1974, he switched professions and became a cowboy, managing a 5,000-acre cattle ranch in the Oklahoma Panhandle. For the next seven years, John worked as a cowboy. And in retrospect, John can see how God was using that experience to heavily influence his writing style. Every morning, John would wake up several hours earlier than was necessary for his job in order to spend time writing and honing his craft. He studied other authors, dissected their stories, attended writing conferences, and submitted hundreds and hundreds of story pitches to publishers. These in turn resulted in a mountain of rejection letters, probably over a thousand. One editor's rejection letter especially stood out when it said that his particular novel submission had, quote, too much integrity and not enough sex. Apparently, John's Christian worldview wasn't welcome with mainstream publishers. John's writing career seemed to be at a dead end, but at the moment that John was least expecting, God was about to bring the most unlikely literary character out of John's pen. Well, this would have been probably in 1981. I was uh, working as a ranch cowboy, making $500 a month, and uh, had a wife and two children. And uh, to supplement my income, I was writing humorous stories for livestock publications. I had flunked out of the literary world, and so I was just writing for whoever would pay me a little money for my experiences as a, as a cowboy. And uh, the Cattleman Magazine had agreed to buy a year's supply of humor stories about my cowboy work. And uh, that was 12 stories. They were going to pay me... 150 bucks, I think, for each. So I set out to write them as quickly as I could. And uh, and I wrote them pretty quickly, I think in two weeks or so. All of them? Yeah, all of them. Wow. And they started out being nonfiction stories about things that I was doing in my work. And they were funny. But as, as I went along, I started getting thin on ideas and remembered two dogs that I had known uh, in my cowboy work. Hank was an Australian shepherd on a ranch in uh, Oklahoma, and Drover was a little mutt that lived on the ranch I was working on at the time in Texas. They had never known each other, and uh, I put them together in a story about ranch dogs. The unwritten part of owning a cow dog is that they're genetically attracted to livestock, but you have to show them what to do with it. And most ranchers either don't know that or don't want to take the time. It takes time. And after you've spent time raising your children and getting along with your wife and managing your ranch, you don't want to spend extra hours teaching the dog how to uh, work with cattle. So you have all these stock dogs that don't know what they're supposed to do, and they they think they're uh, doing something very important, and they're they're dingbats, <laughs> and are usually in trouble of one sort or another. And I thought that was funny. That it was one of twelve stories. I finished it. I wrote it in about three hours. And uh, at seven thirty, I I stopped, went to the house, got a bite of breakfast, and drove to the ranch and started my my day's work 
as a cowboy. The next morning at 4.30, I was back at my little office, and I wrote the next story in that series. When I was done, I sent them to the Cattleman magazine. The Cattleman published no fiction. Ever. Ever. It was in their guidelines for authors. And uh, I think in that world, the word fiction is synonymous with lying. They might read Lewis L'Amour and Elmer Kelton. They consider them honest novelists. Everybody else is is telling an untruth. Yeah. And so they don't publish fiction. The editor <clears throat> didn't blink an eye, never said a word about those Hank stories, which there were two of them. And I assume you didn't mention anything to the editor no. either. No, I wanted my $150. And uh, so they ran in the magazine, and nobody thought anything about it. I certainly didn't recognize that there was anything special in the Hank stories. But at some point, probably 80, 82, I was living in this little town, and uh, I uh, would go to uh, clubs and organizations in town who had programs, and I would do readings of what, what I had written to prove to my parents' friends that I wasn't, I wasn't a hippie or a deadbeat. I was doing something in my mornings and had, had goals. And uh, my stories were funny and they were well received, but the one that got the best reception was the first Hank story. And people recognized what I did not recognize, that there was, there was some sparkle, some, some special life in, in that character. And they said, that's really good, you need to do more with that dog. And if I had not done that, if they hadn't told me that, I don't know that I would have recognized it. So at some point, I took their advice and I tried to write uh, an entire short novel narrated by this character. I didn't know whether I could do it or not. From the very first Hank story, Hank is telling the story, but he does not uh, see himself the way everybody else sees him, and he's not too smart. Um, as he tells the story, he is head of ranch security. He's in charge of uh, management of this ranch. And uh, the people on the ranch don't always recognize uh, his gifts. They don't know that he has this, this important job. And they often think that he acts like a fool. And he... Uh, has the natural tendency to uh, tell little lies to cover his his mistakes. So that was all present from the very beginning, and uh, that character is very intuitive to me. I didn't plan the character, and uh, I wrote three chapters and hit a snag and uh, read those chapters to a cowboy that I had worked with, and. Uh, he just laughed till tears rolled down his cheeks and said, you gotta finish that, that's really great. So I did and uh, started my own publishing company in my garage in Perryton and uh, we self-published it. I went out and, and uh, sold it, not in bookstores, in Western stores, uh, little drug stores, grocery stores in towns in my area. And I did readings, um, sold books after the readings, and uh, went to county fairs and rodeos. And that is where most of the first two Hank books, they were within a 120 mile radius of my hometown. And they were mostly uh, farm and ranch people who bought those books. People love that this dog named Hank was funny. Not only that, but they could also identify with many of Hank's character flaws, the predicaments those flaws led him into, and the lessons that he learned along the way. And John loved helping other people laugh. For him, laughter was an expression of our wonder about the created world. The same God who created the universe also created laughter, and humor was an integral part of God's creation that should be celebrated and not taken for granted. But even though John enjoyed writing the Hank stories, 
he still thought of himself as a serious author and definitely not a children's author. But once again, God had other plans. The stories are very subtle, and uh, I would never have predicted that children could understand the character. I have a lot of wordplay in the stories. That's one of the things I loved about Mark Twain is the way he used dialect and the way he played with language. And uh, Mark Twain was the one author I enjoyed reading when I was in the fourth grade. And uh, his fingerprints are all over the Hank books. But, uh, you know, there's an interesting story that I read in a biography of Mark Twain that when he wrote uh, Tom Sawyer, he considered it a book for, for adults. And his wife, Livy, said, no, this is, a, this is a boy's book. It's a book for kids. He made him mad, said it is not. <laughs> but six months later, he said, okay, she was right. It's a book for boys. And Chris made this similar comment when she edited the first Hank book. She said, this would make a great children's story. And it made me mad. I don't write children's stories. I'm a man of literature. But after we brought out, oh, probably three Hank books, I was selling them to strictly adult audiences. When I went out and did readings, there were no kids in the audience. Oh, so these were not school library readings. These were adult readings. I was working as a paid after-dinner speaker, and I was going all the way from the Gulf Coast of Texas up into uh, Montana, and Canada. I was doing programs for cattle raisers, cattle feeders, uh, the western barley growers of Alberta and Saskatchewan, shrimpers on the Texas Gulf Coast. They were people involved in, uh, in livestock and farming. There were never any children in the audience. But I got a call from a school librarian in a little town near Perryton, and she asked me to do a program for her elementary kids and I said well I can do the program but they won't understand the humor it's it's way too subtle she said well they're bringing their parents books to school and they're reading them and they're laughing and they think they understand it so that's was the first program I did for children and I started getting more calls from schools and oh within six months or a year I was booked in the elementary schools and uh, was no longer going. I wasn't working as an after-dinner speaker in Iowa or Nebraska. And I uh, stopped arguing with the librarians. Okay, I'm a children's book author. <laughs> and it was really a better place to be than where I had uh, thought I wanted to be. Children's book market, it's a, it's a very good place to be in in terms of book sales because when kids are in oh, fourth grade, their parents are very interested in them learning how to read, and they, they buy books. And when I go to these home, home school conventions, I meet uh, mothers and, and uh, fathers and sometimes kids who talk about uh, dyslexia. It's a theme that comes up over and over again. Dyslexic kids who do not read anything until they run into a Hank audio book and they hear the story, and then they follow along with the words, and it, it gets them started writing. Wow. I don't know that I was dyslexic. The word didn't exist when I was growing up, and uh, but I might have been. Uh, reading has always been hard for me, and it still is, and I write the Hank books for me first. So I make them as accessible as possible to someone who's a slow reader. Yeah. So it's another of those things that happened to me that I, I didn't plan. It's turned out much better than what I had in mind. Yeah, that's great. It's another, uh, I think, another example of like God had this bigger plan, bigger and grander than anything that you had in mind or could have, could have hoped for or aspired for, I bet. Yeah, yep. Well, we have to remain open to the, the friendly powers that are trying to push us in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. Including God and, and parents and, and uh, spouses. Today, John has written 73 Hank the Cowdog books and sold over 10 million copies. 
And of course, those kinds of numbers naturally attract attention from the mainstream entertainment world, including Nickelodeon and Disney. Shortly after Hank began gaining popularity, John was approached by CBS about adapting the first Hank book into a standalone episode for a TV series called Story Break. After John agreed, he was shocked at the changes CBS made in the final version that was aired on television and realized that once again, his Christian worldview wasn't welcome. CBS replaced the father, mother, and son in his book with a female ranch boss and two men, the three of them all living in the same home. There was no sign of a son either. As John watched all 13 episodes in the Story Break TV series, each episode adapted from a different children's book, he realized that only one of them depicted a traditional family with one husband and one wife. Definitely not a coincidence. Needless to say, John was not happy and didn't grant any further film rights to CBS. Today, John is still thinking about making a Hank movie someday, but for now, is still going strong writing Hank stories. I asked him where he finds inspiration for each book. I don't do uh, hard ranch work the way I used to. I used to love doing hard manual labor. And I, I was able to do that up to about age 69. But I think I would rather play my banjo and do Hank programs uh, for homeschool families than uh, be a heroic cowboy, although I love doing it while I could. Now my son... He branded calves yesterday. Okay. I write two books a year at a certain time of year. I I know that it's time to start another Hank book, and I usually start with uh, some something that's going on on my ranch. In the winter, it might be a storm, uh, a blizzard, an ice storm, a howling north wind, uh, a fire in the wood stove something gives me the idea of the season of course i'm i'm uh, living out on an isolated ranch with uh, one wife and two dogs and i observe the things my dogs are doing and that's usually where a hank hank story starts i usually don't know where the story is going to go and if i the times that I have, I've tried to outline a story and plan it out, and I never finished the story because if I know how it's going to turn out, I have less reason for writing it. So uh, it'll be time when I get back home, get done with my, my spring uh, speaking engagements, it'll be time to start a, another Hank book, and I'll uh, start with the buzzards floating around outside my office or coyotes howling and at first light in the morning or I might see some animal that uh, draws a response from my dogs and that's where that's where we'll start I've got six I stay six books ahead six <clears throat> books ahead I don't like to write um, under pressure of a deadline and also I found that letting a book mellow for three years is a, a good idea. In that period of time, I'll go back and revise those books maybe 20 times. And uh, if it requires much uh, revision, it probably means the book is not very good. I've thrown out six books. Wow. That just seem tired. And uh, that's not acceptable. It's like running a restaurant. The fact that you served great food yesterday doesn't mean you can survive if you serve bad food today. You live and die every day by what you do. And uh, that's the way it is uh, with me. A few years ago, John published a book called Storycraft. And in the first half of the book, he tells about his own journey into the publishing industry and how Hank came about. The second half of the book is a reflection about faith and culture and about how our worldview influences our writing styles and the things we write about. But he also goes into great detail giving advice for aspiring authors and novelists. And John shared some of that advice with me as we wrapped up our interview. One of the things I say in Storycraft is that if you don't believe the first verse in the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, then I can't teach you anything about writing. And uh, I admire 
uh, Christians who are trying to get into the arts. I think uh, in my case, I just try to write honest books and capture my wonder uh, at God's creation and give people a gift of laughter and make their children have sparkles in their eyes. And, and I am giving them the, the equivalent of good home-cooked food that will nourish their bodies. I'm glad that uh, I'm not known strictly as a Christian author. My books have been translated, about 25 of them, into Farsi, the language of Iran. And I'm delighted that Muslims can read Hank books and get a laugh out of it. They need a laugh too. Laughter is a gift from God. Also, you have to say that Jesus was a storyteller. That was the medium he operated in. And he wasn't trying to explain his theory of storytelling. He was telling stories to people who understood the stories, and it had a, it had a powerful effect on them. That's why we remember him 2,000 years later. It began as storytelling, and that's what the Old Testament is, too. I think theologians might labor under the burden of thinking that they do have to explain everything. I don't. I just accept that this is something the master designer thought of that we never would have thought of. And it's there, just like our relationship with dogs. I think one of the best lines in Storycraft is, only the maker of galaxies would have thought to give mankind such a marvelous gift as a dog. As I spoke with John and heard about his approach to vocation, I was reminded of the Apostle Paul. We always think of Paul as a great evangelist who was carrying the gospel of Jesus throughout the world and writing parts of the Bible. But we can often forget that Paul also had another occupation at the same time. He was a tent maker. He had a vocation making tents, and he brought glory to God through his craft. Likewise, Jesus was the very Son of God, but he was also a carpenter who made things with his hands. And in the same vein, whether we're missionaries in the jungles, accountants in the workforce, stay-at-home moms raising children, or writing books about a cow dog, God can be equally glorified in all of those things. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the tent-making Apostle Paul says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. You can follow John Erickson and learn more about Hank the Cowdog at his website, hankthecowdog.com. And while you're there, make sure to browse Hank's book catalog. If you've never read a Hank the Cowdog story before, then now is a great time. This week, we're also giving away three of John's books to our listeners at our website, compelledpodcast.com. We're giving away book number one in the Hank series called The Original Adventures of Hank the Cowdog. And we're also giving away the latest Hank adventure, book number 73, called The Case of the Buried Deer. And we're giving away a copy of Storycraft, which we mentioned earlier in this episode. All three books are autographed, and we'll choose a winner for each book a week from now. So to enter the drawing, just head to compelledpodcast.com, find this episode, and you'll see the entry form towards the bottom of the page. And again, you can find all of that and more at compelledpodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Compelled Podcast and on Twitter at Compelled Show. And please leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. It's one of the best ways to help other people find our show. If you enjoyed listening to today's story and want to keep hearing more, then here are a couple ways that you can help out. The first way that you can support Compelled is by sharing this episode with your friends. If you know someone who would be encouraged by John's story, like a budding author or a believer wanting to get involved in the creative arts, then send this episode to them and consider sharing it on social media. It really makes a difference and helps spread the word about the show. The second way is to join Compelled as a monthly member starting at $10 a month. As a monthly member of Compelled, you'll receive access to different perks, including behind the scenes recordings from our interviews, which is definitely the most popular perk for our members. When I actually sit down and interview guests, the actual recording is normally around two hours. And there are all kinds of stories and insights that we end up cutting out of the final episode because of time constraints. But if you really enjoyed listening to a guest like John today, then you can dive deeper and listen to all of our behind the scenes content when you become a monthly member. 
And at our $15 a month membership level, you'll also be invited to an exclusive monthly live stream. Once a month, you'll be sent a link to an invite-only video feed where you can meet other compelled listeners. You can meet some of the team members from the podcast, and occasionally, we might even bring on one of our guests from the show to directly answer any questions you may have. And for a limited time, monthly members receive a free movie from Christian Cinema, another one of our sponsors. Since 1999, Christian Cinema has provided entertainment that inspires families. Christian Cinema has no monthly fees, and they have the largest selection of Christian and family-friendly movies. You can watch a movie today at ChristianCinema.com and get a free movie by becoming a compelled monthly member at any level. But of course, the biggest benefit of being a monthly member is you're allowing Compelled to continue sharing these important stories. You can become a monthly member today by visiting compelledpodcast.com and clicking the link at the top that says Become a Member. This episode was edited by Zach Fowler. Find him online at zachfowlerimagery.com. Our logo was designed by Josiah Jost. View his work at siadesign.com. Our website was created by Ben Billups. Follow Ben on Instagram at ben.billups. Our media assistant is Frank Allegrea. Find him on Twitter at the Frank Allegrea. Our music outro is by Ben Jackson and Brian Facchino, and our assistant producer is none other than my wonderful wife, Sarah Hastings. Stay tuned for a sneak peek from next week's episode with Todd Nettleton from Voice of the Martyrs. For decades, Todd has met with persecuted believers from around the globe that have suffered for their faith in Jesus. Todd has found his own faith strengthened while witnessing the faith of others that have given their all. I'm your host, Paul Hastings, and we'll be back with another compelling story next Tuesday. My first question is, so Sister Tong, tell me about the prison and uh, what I'm picturing in my American journalistic mind is, you know, tell me how, how miserable it was. Tell me how hard the bed was. Tell me how cold it was. Tell me how the rain leaked in when it rained. Um, so my translator translates the question. Sister Tong gets this amazing smile on her face. She says something in Chinese and the translator says, oh yes, that was a wonderful time. And my first thought was, there's no way he translated the question right.